Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. This is more people here than I expected, so that's great to see. My name's Matt Mesmer. I'm going to be talking today about migrations in Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. And a little bit about myself. I'm a Drupal architect at Clarity Partners here in Chicago. We work on a lot of websites for Cook County and other government agencies around the area. I've been working in Drupal for about 12 years now, and it's probably done around 15 to 20 migrations in Drupal 8 and 9 so far. As part of what I'm going to be showing you today, it's going to, later half of the session is going to be a demo, and I put together a demo repo that I mentioned a little bit before. So if anybody wants to go grab the code, it should be a fully functioning Drupal 9 site using Lando as the local development environment. I'll be showing off a little bit of the special things I put together in the repo later, but it's out there publicly if anybody wants to go grab it. it might be helpful, I hope. As an overview of what we're going to be covering today, we're going to be looking at the use cases for migrations and then quickly going over some contrib modules and drush commands you can use while doing migrations. And then I'll be doing a deeper dive into writing custom source and process plugins for migrations. So just to get a feel of the room, how many people here have used the Migrate API in Drupal 8 or 9 or 10? Okay, so about half of you or a little bit more. How many have written their own plugins? Okay, great. And how many have used the migration API to do something other than migrate Drupal 7 or WordPress into Drupal 8 or Drupal 9? Okay, so only two of you. Okay, so this is great because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So when I look online or see the sessions at DrupalCon or Drupal Camps about the Migrate API, it's almost all exclusively about that use case. The, you have a Drupal 7 site or maybe a WordPress site and you need to migrate that site to Drupal 8, Drupal 9, Drupal 10. And I think that's what most people think of when they think of the Migrate API in Drupal. But it can be used for a lot more than that. If any of you remember back to Drupal 7, there was the feeds module. And you had the feeds module and it could consume XML or maybe at that time it could consume JSON, I don't remember. But you could take this data that's outside Drupal and get it into Drupal. And more often than not, that's how I find myself using the Migrate API in Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. You can use it for the other type of migration, like Drupal 7, and it's, it's great at that, but that topic's really covered ad nauseum in other places, so I'm not really going to be talking about that specifically, although some of the things I'm talking about here today you could use in those types of migrations. So our use case for this topic, for this session, in a, in a broad sense, is that we have data that's not in Drupal, and we want to get that data into Drupal so we can use it, and we want to reduce the time spent on content entry. Because, of course, you can just go in and manually enter all your content, or you can use other ways to load in content with MySQL, but the, the goal for me is to minimize the time that we spend on the content entry, and try and find the most efficient way possible to pull it in. In the past, I've used the Migrate API to pull in data from various sources. We had GTFS data, which is transit data for different things like buses and trains to import schedules on regular intervals or import the station information for the trains. I've used it on projects where we had an external product information system, a PIM, and we needed to nightly fetch the updated product information that was being managed by a completely different department of this large company that we were working with. So we had to fetch the updated pricing, all this other product information, and get it into Drupal so it could be utilized by the Drupal website. 
And another use case that I find is really common is when we're building the website, we need to load the site with content. And instead of doing manual content entry, we can use the Migrate API to preload the site with data from CSV files or spreadsheets. And there's a workflow that I'm going to show that will hopefully reduce some of the time spent on the manual content entry. And it also makes for a nice workflow where we don't have to be exchanging databases back and forth because the, the data is all saved in spreadsheets and can be managed in a central location or even managed by non-technical people who are working with our clients or in other departments to get the content ready for the Drupal site without them having to know Drupal itself. So I've, so far I've been talking a lot about using the Migrate API to get this sort of data into Drupal, but why use the Migrate API? There's plenty of other sources we can use. There's the like default content module in Drupal that you can use to replace that CSV thing I was talking about where it'll load in default content into the website. We could manually import the content. What is the Migrate module really offering us? And these are the reasons that I think make a compelling argument for using the Migrate API. The data we have in Drupal is usually interconnected. We have nodes referencing taxonomy, nodes referencing other nodes, nodes referencing files. The Migrate API in Drupal handles all this for us. It's already built in that it will handle all these references as long as we have consistent IDs that we can map between the different sources, it'll handle all this for us. We don't have to be tracking it ourselves. Um, in addition, number two, I'm usually when I'm working on data like this, it's not just one section of the site that needs data loaded in. It's a bunch of different types of content. And I like to keep things as consistent as possible and use one approach for many different solutions where possible to make it easy for me and other developers so that we know how that there's this one way that we're doing it and we don't have to be juggling a lot of different approaches. Number three, the Migrate API comes with a built-in system for tracking what content it's already migrated. There's a Migrate map table where it tracks all this. So it can keep track of which content's new in the source, which content needs to be updated. And that's just another thing that we don't have to code. There's also a built-in system for deleting the content, for rolling back. Because often when doing development, I'm constantly importing the content. So there's a, seeing how it worked, did it have any errors, roll back, delete everything, go again. It handles all the content deletion for me. Even when doing things like the file migrations, it'll delete the files that it imported, that it put into the site's all files the directory. So it, it does all that for us. And it's also a system that if you're not using it to run migrations from an API or an external source repeatedly, if it's something you're just using to load content in at the site launch, you can use it and then remove these modules, uninstall them. And I found that it's never caused issues. That it's real clean to get rid of if you don't need it later. And the last one that I think is really cool is that I've often been able to use the migrate map table. That's where it, it tracks the source ID and the destination ID, usually the destination ID being the like node ID or taxonomy term ID. It provides this mapping table where if you have a source where like in, I'll show this in more detail later, but like if we have a CSV where we have a a string ID of whatever terms we're importing. Like, we don't have to keep memorizing all these node IDs or taxonomy term IDs when it gets migrated in. We can use the lookup function in the database table to search for our source ID and get returned the Drupal node ID or term ID that could be dynamic. And this can make our code a lot more workable when we're dealing with multiple environments where sometimes the node IDs don't match. And without a 
solution like this, we have to sometimes like trade databases back and forth, and it, that can cause its own problems. But conversely, there's sometimes when migrations might not be the best fit for your solution. Um, I have a joke here about how I, I named the session the migration for all seasons. So here I am giving you reasons why you might not want to use it. And there's some irony in that. I don't know, I'm, I'm not very good at making jokes. <laughs> but um, these, there's points that I think we need to consider when choosing our approach. And one of the points is the level of effort, because writing these migrations can be a lot of effort. And if you don't have a very big data set, or the data set's really simple, it can sometimes be a lot more effort to write the migration than to just manually create your like, five taxonomy terms and, and just call it a day. <laughs> um, the other thing to consider is, does the data have a fixed pattern? This is really important. If the data you're trying to import doesn't have a set structure and a reliable pattern to it, it can be more difficult to ma map your source data to the fields in Drupal. Because the migration, it's like this one-to-one -one mapping of your, your source data field to the, the destination data, your field in Drupal. So if it's something where it doesn't have that fixed pattern and you'd have to be making more of a, a decision each time about how it works, then you're probably going to have to end up doing it manually to be able to utilize that. And also, do you need to have real-time data updates? I mentioned before we have like the, we did a migration for the GTFS data or the PIM data. This was something that needed to be updated, but it wasn't something that was constantly changing. The, the PIM data could be updated once a night. It's not that we had to update the price on the website from the PIM immediately, like two minutes after it, it got updated. It could just be updated once a day. If you have data that needs to be updated in real time as soon as possible, the migration may not be a good source because it needs to run on a fixed schedule and there's going to be some delay between when the data is updated in the source and when it's going to be reflected on the Drupal website. Some other potential pitfalls that I've encountered is WYSIWYG fields. This isn't so much a problem if you're going from the same WYSIWYG to the same WYSIWYG. It's like if you have in your old system, you're using one type of WYSIWYG. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the one in Drupal 7 we use in CSCK Editor. Um, but it, the WYSIWYGs have their own codes that they put into the text to tell it how to work. And that can, I have never been able to successfully migrate that programmatically from one system to the other. The, the other issue is that when you are have when you have your spreadsheets or CSVs for importing data, and I'll, I'll give an example of this later. If you have content that has really complex relationships, especially paragraphs, where you have one type of paragraph for layout and then it's nested with the text and image, it, it's very hard to manage that through CSVs and trying to manage that data through the, the spreadsheets or CSVs can often be more complicated than if you would just manually enter the content. And the other pitfall is you have to write code. So if you don't like to write code, if you're scared of code, then, well, this probably isn't gonna, isn't gonna be fun for you. So let's take a real quick look at some of the contrib modules. If, I think most of this is going to be familiar to the people here since everybody, almost everybody said they'd done migrations before, but just to get everybody acquainted. Drupal core comes with the migrate module. That's what we're using. It provides the base functionality for everything. There's also the migrate plus contrib module. This is what allows us to export our migration config into YAML, which is how we can save it into GitHub and move it around easily. And it also provides some different source plugins that we can use for making migrations from XML and JSON. The core migrate module provides the database connection source, so that's where if you have your like, D7 site that you're trying to migrate from. 
There's also migrate tools, which is another contrib module. This used to be more required because it provided the Drush integration, but as of Drush 10.1, a lot of the migrate integration for Drush is now part of Drush core. So having said that, migrate tools does still provide a few additional options which are useful. It provides a sync flag when running the migrations. And this is something that you can use to delete any content in Drupal that isn't still in the source. Depending on your use case, that, that might be something you want to do. We have a lot of cases where that's not what we want to do. We, we don't want it to delete all the old nodes that aren't in the API call anymore. Migrate Tools also provides a migrate executable class, which can be used to run migrations in code. Specifically, if you have a cron hook and you're trying to run migrations from the cron hook, I'll provide an example of that later. And then lastly, there's the migrate source CSV module that I use a lot. This provides a CSV source plugin, which is going to be used a lot. Yeah? Uh, there's also a migrate debug module, which is also very useful. Migrate debug? Yeah. Okay. Um, I haven't used that, but as part of the demo, I'm going to be showing how you can my debug your migrations using xdebug. And then, again, some of these Drush commands are probably familiar to most people here, but let's just take a look real quick so that when I run them as part of the demo, maybe we can remember what they are without me having to explain it every time. We have Drush MS, which is the migrate status. This will list all your migrations and show how many items have already been imported. There's MIM, which is the migrate import. You provide the migration name or you can send it a group. I'll show the groups later as I show the migration YAML files. The useful flags here that um, I wanted to point out are not just group, but there's also limit, which is if you have a big migration that has like 5,000 entries and you don't want to run all 5,000 of them at once, you can pass a limit flag to limit it to however many you want to run. This with Drush 10 works a little bit weird in that let's say you already imported 10. If you send a limit of 10, it will count the 10 you already imported as part of that 10 and then won't import anything unless you pass the, the next one of the next ones, the update flag to update the already existing nodes. Um, it didn't used to work this way. It used to then, if you had 10 imported and you ran it with limit 10, it would import 10 new ones. But now you have to then pass like limit 20 so that it'll count the 10 that are already there and then import 10 new ones. There's also the ID list flag. You can pass a specific source ID. Let's say there's like one particular piece of content you're using for testing, but it's not the first one in the, the list, like you don't normally get that as the first thing that would be migrated when you run the import. You can send the specific ID so that you're always testing with that particular ID. I found that's useful sometimes where like this particular one had an error and I tried to fix the migration to fix that error. So then instead of running through the 200 items that are before it, I can just run the migration again for that particular one that had the error and see if it got fixed. The update flag I already mentioned, that'll update your nodes that have already been imported through the migration. So if the source changed, you can update them. And there's the execute dependencies flag. The sole, with the migrations, you can set dependencies of other migrations. So like you got your nodes that reference taxonomy. You can say the taxonomy migration is a dependency, so it imports the taxonomy first. And with this flag, instead of the migration giving you an error and saying your taxonomy hasn't been imported yet, it'll run the taxonomy migration as well as the other migration that you were trying to run. The next command is MR. This is the rollback, migrate rollback command. This will delete all the content that was previously imported through the previous command. This one you can also send the group flag. So if you want to delete d multiple migrations at once, you can do that. There's the MRS, which is the reset status. 
this one's useful when you had an error when importing and it gets stuck and it says it's still importing or it says it had a problem, you reset the status to idle and that'll let you run the migration again. And then the M message flag, which is migrate message, you can run this to show the error message that was logged when your migration failed. So, let's briefly talk about how we create migrations and the different components of them, and then we'll get into the demo. So the, this is a image that I got out of the drupal.org migration API documentation. It shows the extract transform load concept where we have our, we want to extract data and transform the data and load the data. And how this translates into Drupal and the Migrate API is we have a source plugin, a process plugin, and the destination plugin. So the, we extract the data from the source plugin. This is where our data is coming from. So the CSV file or the other database or the API, whatever we're pulling data from, that's the source. And the source plugin controls how we connect to that source. Then we can transform data using process plugins. So this is the real meat of it. Often the data that's in the source doesn't match how Drupal wants its data. Most notably, it's always like dates. Drupal database wants the date in a certain format, and your API is giving you the date in a different format. Or the API has a value of zero for a certain field, and this needs to get transposed into a different Drupal field value that you want to store or something even more wacky and complex, and I'll show you in some of the examples. And then we have our destination, which is something in Drupal, because we're migrating into Drupal. So usually this is a node or a taxonomy, but there's other destination plugins. You can just save your data into a database table, and the migration API will handle all the, the SQL commands that are needed to save the data. Um, I find that I've never really needed to write a custom destination plugin. Maybe you'd need to do that if you're using like a custom entity or something, but usually we're just using nodes. So um, just use the, we usually just use the default ones that come with the migrate, core migrate module. But we've written a lot of custom source and process plugins and be getting into that. One thing that I want to note here is that even though this is the sort of ideal situation, because this is a Drupal, it, it doesn't really adhere to this. Often the easiest way to transform your data isn't to do it in the process plugins. You can use a thing I'll show with the prepare row method in the source plugin, and in prepare row you can just like do whatever you want with your data and add whatever data and manipulate it, and it's way easier than writing process plugins, but um, there's, we'll see how both approaches have their merits. But I think it's funny that they, they say it, it's this, but it doesn't really work like this. <laughs> so just to cover this real quickly, we have the migrate core migrate module and the migrate, uh, migrate plus module provide a lot of different process plugins that are ready made for us. And these can be really useful if we have pretty simple manipulations that we want to do. These are some of the ones that I find myself using frequently. And there's links to the documentation where you can see there's like a ton more. There's the default value plugin. This allows you just in your YAML to say that this field has a default value. It's, like it's not going to think about it. Just when it runs the migration, every time this field gets this value. So often you use this to set like a, like every, Every node that this migration creates, just assign it a specific user ID. Just don't think about it, just give it this user ID. There's format date. As I mentioned before, that dates are often a stumbling block of the migrations because the Drupal, um, Drupal fields expect the date to be in a certain format. Or the created date, the created time on the node expects it to be a Unix timestamp, so you need to convert it. And format date allows you to specify your source um, time format, like in the PHP format, and then the destination, destination format, and it'll convert it for you. 
there's static map where you can have you can in the YAML define a map of source value to destination value, like if zero should be converted to yes and or zero should be converted to no and one should be converted to yes. There's the migration lookup, which you'll use all the time when you have migrations that are referencing other migrations, so you get your nodes entity reference field connected to your taxonomy migration. And there's skip on empty, which is nice if you have a, a certain value in the migration source. If this value is empty, we want to skip this and not import it. And then migrate plus provides the skip on value, which is similar to skip on empty, except you instead of it being empty, you can say if, if the source has this particular value in the field, we want to skip it. And there's entity lookup, which is similar to the migration lookup, but instead of providing, instead of mapping based on the source IDs, you can run like an entity query of certain values to look up what entity you want to reference. These can all be chained together. So you can have one call one and then call another and call another. I find that once you start chaining many of them together, it can get kind of confusing what you're doing and I like writing code, so I often will be transforming really complex things like that in the prepare row, like I mentioned, or writing my own process plugin. So that's what we're going to be getting into. So for the demo, we have four migrations that we're going to be looking at, although really it's three because the last two are kind of part of the same thing. I've put together the this data that I'm migrating, it's a, it's a mock up of Chicago Parks, which was one of our clients. And this is a simplified version of part of what we did for them. All the, all the data is going to be coming from an open data API that the city of Chicago kindly provides. Although, for the purposes of this demo, I've saved the data into the repo so that it's not relying on calling the the external API, which might fail during the demo, and then I'd look like an idiot. So we have the parks migration. This is going to pull data from a JSON API that I just talked about and create nodes for parks that are across Chicago. There's like 500 of them or something. And it has a custom source plugin that I'll be showing. We have a staff migration, which is mimicking, like you have staff that work at the parks. And these are nodes, and they're coming from a CSV. So let's say at the, when we create the site, we want to show all the staff, and the employees of the Chicago Parks District are preparing a CSV for us that contain the staff bios. And then we have a ratings migration and movies migration, because you may not know, but the Chicago parks in the summer, they'll have movies showing in the parks. And you can go to the park and watch a movie on a projector. So these are like events that are having, happening at the park. So we have these event nodes, the movie nodes. And the movies have a rating. So we want to show on the website what the rating is of the movie, PG, PG-13, G. And these are a taxonomy that we're migrating in. So without further ado, let's try to show the demo and hope that this works. <coughs> OK. So we've got our Drupal 9 website with, with no content in it. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the parks migration. So each, each migration that you create will have one of these YAML files. I find the easiest way to do these is just to create them directly in the config directory and you don't enter the UUID and you create it by copying it from somewhere, like the Migrate Plus has some examples. 
And if you import and then export the config, it'll automatically generate your UUID. So you don't have to have it in the in the config install folder in your custom module, because then you're tracking like two versions of the YAML file. You have your one in the module and you have your one that's being exported and they get out of sync. So our our YAML file here is basically broken down into three parts, so four parts. We have our part up here at the top where we have our ID. This will be referenced throughout the migration. This is, and then it's broken down into three other parts. We have source and process and destination. So that maps up with the, the, um, the thing I was showing before where we have our, our three types of plugins. And for this migration, our plugin is the the park source. This is a custom custom uh, source plugin that I created. That's extending the URL source plugin. That's part of Migrate Plus. This is what allows us to pull the source data from the URL. Could you zoom in a little bit? Is that better? So the source data for the URL migration needs to be mapped. So we have a API call here where we can see all this different information that's returned about the parks. And we don't need most of this. There's just certain fields that we want to use. And so we need to tell the migration which ones we want to use. So we have our park number. This is the, the value in the API call. And we tell it this is the source ID. And this is what we're using here to say that this is the source ID of the migration. This will be what's saved in the migrate map table. And we specify a bunch of other values from the API that we're using. And then these get mapped in the process section of the YAML file, where we have our Drupal value on the left. And then on the right side of the YAML is the, the value that we declared up in the source section of the, the API data. So for more complex fields, like the address field, where it has different elements, we have the we have the different selector for the address line one, the locality, just using that default value process plugin I mentioned. And then the, the real magic thing that we're going to be looking at is here for the geo field. This is using the geodata source. But geodata isn't, isn't up here in our fields that are coming from the API. So where is geodata coming from? And this is coming from a separate API call that we are adding in the prepare row method of this custom source plugin that I created. So as I mentioned in prepare row, we can add or manipulate the information, the, the source data that we're going to be migrating. And this is going to be pulling in from a an additional API. Every every park, it's going to make another API call to pull in this geo-coded polygon data, the, the shape of the park on the map. And we need to do this because the initial API doesn't have this information. It has our like two GPS coordinates, but that's just one point on the map. And we want to show the bounds of the park on the map. And there was a separate API that we can call that has a query parameter to restrict the call to just one park. And so for every park, we call this API to get the big, long JSON of all the different polygon coordinates. And this will dynamically call using the park ID, which is being we get the source property, the source ID, so that's that park number, the, the unique identifier in the API of that particular park. It's not, it's not going to be our node ID in Drupal, but it's, it's mapped to that node ID, so we know which park is associated with that node ID. And it calls the API and 
pulls in that data and processes it and, and sets the source property of geodata with our polygon data. So so we can run this and I didn't update Lando because I thought if I update Lando and it doesn't work then the demo is going to break so just leave well enough alone and we have 581 parks here and we are migrating them in and it goes pretty fast because it's running all the calls locally on the, the machine. And now if we go back to our site and we refresh this we should see a bunch of different nodes that got created. We have all our all our parks. Yeah, and if we go to this view that I set up beforehand, we will see our map with a ton of parks on it. And all these these are all the coordinates that we pulled in from that API. It got saved into the node in Drupal and through the magic of the view handler that comes with the geo, uh, whatever, geolocation module, it makes this map. So that, that's magic trick number one, calling a subsequent API call for every single row to get additional information loaded in that isn't part of the initial API call we're using for the migration. So. The second, the second trick is in our staff migration. And that trick is that we have a CSV migration that's going to create these nodes. And it's going to not just create the node, but it's also going to create a media entity and the file entity that's referenced by the media entity all part of one CSV source file. So it, it has to be three separate migrations because each entity that's being created has to be its own migration. But we have one CSV file which will then create the three different nodes and they'll all reference each other. The node references the media entity, the media entity references the file entity. And it will also pull the files into the Drupal file system and put them in the correct directory. So that migration, we have our three migrations here. We have our staff CSV migration. The source here is source is plugin CSV. This is the plugin that's provided by that migrate CSV mo contrib module that I mentioned. This isn't a custom plugin that's extending it, it's just the one that comes with the module. We have our path to our CSV file, which is here in our, in our custom module. There's a CSV file here for staff. And this is just a standard CSV file. It's kind of hard to see, but we got our stuff up here. Um, one thing I'll mention, make sure you don't have space after your comma, because then it won't work. Make sure there's no spaces after the commas. I ran into that when hand typing out the CSV. Um, so we have all our different properties here. I think it, yeah, it'll show it here in a table. We have our ID, and this is just something that you can, in this case, you can give it whatever you want. It can be a sequential number identifier. It just has to be something unique. And then there's two fields here, first name, last name. These are concatenated using one of the, the ready-made process plugins that concatenates the first name and the last name properties to create the title of the node. And then we have all our other mappings here. And down here we have our field image. We have the migration lookup plugin. So it's going to look up to the media migration, the staff CSV media image migration, using that CSV ID as the value to look up which media entity to reference. And because we only have one, one uh, 
image for each staff member, we can just reuse the same ID across all three migrations. So here for the media image, we're also using the CSV as the source. We are creating, mapping our different um, media fields, including the target ID, which is then using the image, the file image migration to um, map it. And this is where we've set our process here for where we want to save the file to. So if we, we can run all of these together using the group, because they're all part of the staff group, and it'll run all three. And it creates two items for each one. And the group automatically orders them, right? It seems to, because I've set the dependencies. Um, I've set the dependency here, so each one is depending on the subsequent one, and it seems to run them in the correct order. So we have our, our node, and it's got me with my image. This image was saved originally in the module where it's referenced from, but then it gets moved into sites, default files, staff image, because that's where we told it to put it here. And if I do rollback, it'll delete not only the nodes, but those images disappeared as well. I'm sorry, where were the source images? I lost track there. The source images for this demonstration were in a custom module, but those could be, those could be anywhere. Okay. You would just need to tell it where they're coming from. Gotcha. The, it's here, the, the source base path is in modules custom migration demo images. But that, that could be anything. It could even be a remote image. You would, you would put the full URL there of where you're pulling the image from. It could be just anywhere that's accessible where you can have a path. And then here we're using the public files directory as our, our destination. If, if you were going to migrate images, would you just write a separate migration You could have, they are separate migrations, it's just that the, the CSV source file is the same. So um, you could use this independently, and I could run migrate import and the, um, the ID of the migration here for just doing the images, and it'll, it'll just run that one. Um, okay, I'm running out of time here, but for the, the last trick, is we have the JSON migration of the movies, and this has some special filtering of the of which things we're going to import based on some settings that can be set in a config form in Drupal. So first, to quickly show the settings form, we have a just standard Drupal settings form, which makes a page here where we can set information. So we're going to do this. And there's this promoted parks field, which is an entity reference lookup whatever field, the entity autocomplete field. So this will autocomplete our parks that we migrated. So we can specify a park that we want to set as the promoted park. And I set it to Wicker Park, because I like Wicker Park. I used to live around there. And then in our movies migration, we have a thing here for promoting the node, the, the feature in Drupal core that you probably never use to promote items to the front page. <laughs> Th this will set that. And for, this is just for the purposes of this demo. That, that, you, know, you probably wouldn't want to actually do the promote thing, but I needed something to set dynamically. So this is the 
promoted thing, and it's set to custom promoted. So where does custom promoted come from? And this comes from the prepare row, but in this case, we're not using a custom source. We're just using the URL plugin that comes from the module. So how do we do our prepare row if we don't have a custom source plugin? And you can do it here in this hook, hook migrate prepare row, which is in the process of being deprecated, but it hasn't been yet, so I'm using it. <laughs> and we switch based on our migration ID, movies JSON, that's the ID of our migration, and it's gonna set the promoted status based on park. So we wanna get the park ID, which is the in the source, that ID that we're using for mapping to the node ID, and it's gonna get our promoted park from that that settings form that we've just made. But the promoted park is gonna be a node ID. So how do we remedy that? That we have a node ID, but the, the migration source, the API, doesn't know what our node IDs are. So we can use that migrate map table that I was talking about. So we have a helper function here for map lookup. And it's gonna do a DB select query on the migrate map table, which we can see here. We have our source ID and our destination ID. The source ID is that park number, and the destination ID is our node ID. And it's gonna get the source ID from the, it's gonna get the, yeah, the, the it's gonna get our node ID based on the source ID, because we're looking up the source in the migration and getting our node ID to see if it matches the node ID that we've saved in the form, which was Wicker Park. So if we then run this with the, that's movies, movies JSON, it'll import, okay, great, it, it failed. <laughs> I ran this this morning and there we go, okay. I don't know, I had to run it with the update flag. But it, now we have our movies, and the ones that are for Wicker Park will be shown here on the front page in the default view for the Drupal front page that it shows the promoted content. And we can go to the park page itself. We see the movies in the sidebar in the view that I made. So these are the movies for Wicker Park. If we go look at a different movie. This is in this park that I'm not gonna try and pronounce. And it's got one movie for Avengers Infinity War. And this one didn't get promoted to the front page because it's not associated with the correct park. Um, for this simple example, you wouldn't really need to do this. You could just like have your front page promoted parks just always be showing Wicker Park ones instead of relying on the promoted value, but maybe you can imagine how in a more complex situation where you have users who want to tweak what's being migrated dynamically without having to update the code of the migration, this could be useful. We've used it in more complex situations where the, the parks have events that are in, they call it like seasons, and some seasons they don't want to have um, automatically published on the site so they can enter the name of the season and then the, the nodes will get imported but they'll be unpublished and this is something that they can manage on the site without having to do a code deploy because otherwise that's what you'd have to do and you'd have to tweak the migration yaml to set it to wicker park using that um one of those other process plugins provided by migrate core module or migrate plus um, so i think we're we're about out of time for my demo is there anybody have some questions? No, it's all clear. Oh. <laughs> uh, have you done any implementations when you're using uh, the CSV source plugin for kind of creating a dynamic form to let end users import their own CSV and have the migration consumer? No, but you could do that. You'd have to create your own custom source plugin that's extending the CSV plugin and then have something here you'd have to have something in your custom source plugin that would 
then be like in the prepare row fetching the location of that CSV and, and parsing through it. Anna could actually do something similar. Did he? upload a CSV. Why didn't he ask me about it? <laughs> <laughs> but they upload a CSV every to update certain <laughs> staff okay. members and then it okay. runs the migration. So. He should have been giving this presentation. Is there, is there any reporting uh, tools in there that, that would make the inventory uh, pretty, pretty for something that seems like, okay, here's everything that's been migrated? Um, so is the, the question was, is there any tool that would give a pretty report of what's been migrated or, or um, such, and not, not built into it? We have built things where when it migrates, it will send an email every, every night, which basically was just capturing this Drush command uh, output and then putting it in an email, because that was all the prettiness it needed to be. But you would have to build something like that. Although, you know, that said, like, if, if, you know, obviously you're using Drush to run the migrations, but in the migration UI itself, I mean, that's pretty nice looking. I and mean, it gives you, you know, like, like when I do migrations, oh, yeah. I'll have like, yeah, like a group for like I've, nodes. And, and then it's nice because it does give you some. I, I actually, I forgot that that even existed. There is yeah. a UI. <laughs> there is a UI that I never use right. that, that does that does show, it'll list your migrations. Yeah, that's um, kind of Yeah, nice. so the, this. So it, it, it does exist. I just <laughs> forgot about it because <laughs> I never I never do it through the UI because um, it it I it might be better now, but it used to be you, you could execute it, but this would always break. Yes, like, not done good. so I I just got out of the habit of even checking that this exists. Yeah. Um, since we're almost at the end, I, one thing I thought we would run out of time that I wanted to show was that here's the code for the the cron that I mentioned I would show that. You can run your migrations through cron, using hook cron. This will just run it every time you run cron. Uh, we always use the ultimate cron module to, to track the timings of, of when the cron jobs get run. If you're not using that, you would have to build some logic in here that's checking the timestamp on when it was last run. But this is going to load your migration. It's going to reset the status to idle just in case so that it won't break. And it'll set here, if you want, you can set the update flag so that previously imported things will get imported again and their values updated. And then here's where you would want to do something to send emails or send some sort of report. <clears throat> well, if anybody wants to talk to me about migrations. Um, I had a, I don't know where my slides are anymore, <laughs> but I had a slide with my, uh, I don't know. I had a slide with my email address on it. I don't know where. <laughs> Here we go. So yeah, please provide feedback. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.